everyone. I'm Violet Brown, and today is an exciting day because I get to talk to you about multi-level modeling. Now, the name multi-level modeling can sound a little intimidating, but I want you to keep in mind that these multi-level models, sometimes called linear mixed effects models, or just mixed models, these are just a slightly beefed up version of the regression you've come to know and love. So, I want to start today by briefly reminding you of a few key points related to regression. Okay, here is our standard regression equation if we just have one predictor. If we're trying to predict an outcome, y hat, for a particular person i, we just plug the x value associated with that person into the equation. Now, this equation is assuming there's just one predictor, but we can easily add more predictors and associated coefficient estimates, no problem. So, for example, maybe we're interested in whether skipping class is related to a student's grade. We'd expect that the higher the proportion of classes you skip, the lower your grade will be. Like this. And if we fit a regression line to these data, this is what it looks like. But presumably skipping class matters more for some classes than for others, right? If you're taking a class that has weekly check-ins, but the lectures and the materials are all available online, it's probably okay if you skip that class without it really hurting your grade. But if you're taking a class that meets three times a week in person and the professor doesn't make anything available outside of class, then skipping class is probably really going to hurt your grade. So the effect of skipping class might differ depending on what class you're talking about. So, in this simulated data set, the blue points and the regression line correspond to the online class I was talking about, so that's the one where everything is made available, and I'm calling that class 1. The yellow points and line correspond to the in-person class, where nothing's available after the fact. I'm calling that class 3. And the green points and line come from a class that falls kind of between those two extremes. What you can see is that the grades are not related to attendance for class 1, but they're super related to attendance for class 3. So ignoring the class the data came from and just looking at that overall regression line I showed on the last slide as if it applied to all the data points, that paints an incomplete picture of what's going on with these data, right? The slope might be negative overall, and that may be true for some classes, but it certainly isn't true for all classes. So we're losing important information about the variation between classes when we do that. In this case, if you just use that overall regression line, you're violating a crucial assumption of regression, the independence assumption. So you're probably somewhat familiar with regression assumptions, and I'm not going to bore you with the details of all of them, but here are a few to jog your memory. The normality assumption says that your residuals should be normally distributed. Note that I didn't say your outcome should be normally distributed. That doesn't matter. It's about the residuals. If your raw data are a little skewed, but the residuals are fine, that's totally fine. Regression also assumes homoskedasticity. That means that the residual variance should be the same across levels of the predictor. It shouldn't be the case that when x is small, your residuals are small, but when x is large, the residuals are large. So if you plot the residuals against the x values, you shouldn't see this fanning out pattern. The error should be constant across levels of x. That's our homogeneity of variance assumption. Now the independence assumption, that's the one that we violated if we ran a standard regression on those skipping class data. That states that your residuals should not be correlated. Put simply, if some of your data points are related to or influenced by some of your other data points, you violated the independence assumption. Uh, repeatedly rolling a die is a nice example of an independent process. The outcome of any roll is completely independent of what happened on previous rolls. So in other words, if I rolled a 2, that doesn't make it any more or less likely that I'll roll a 2 on the next trial, even if it really feels like it. Uh, the probability is always 1 sixth. But drawing cards from a deck without replacement, that's a process that isn't independent. Right, if I was to draw a two of hearts, the probability of drawing another two is reduced relative to the probability of drawing a three, for example. The next draw is dependent upon your previous draw in that case. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's usually okay if you violate the normality assumption or the homogeneity of variance assumption. Regression is particularly robust to violations of the normality assumption. But regression and ANOVAs and those other statistical tests that you've probably encountered are typically not robust to violations of the independence assumption. This is a big one. Violating the independence assumption typically has much more dramatic effects on the inferences you can make from your analyses than violating other regression assumptions. If you don't account for the dependencies in your data, this essentially amounts to artificially increasing your sample size. Now this can be a little bit of a confusing idea to wrap your head around, but the way I think of it is that if you assume independence when it's not there, you're overestimating the amount of independent pieces of information your data contain. For example, if you had 100 observations that are all independent, they're giving you 100 pieces of information about the relationship between x and y. But if they're correlated, then you're not really getting all new information from each of those points, right? Some of that information is redundant with information provided by other points. So what happens to your inferences? Well, your standard error estimates go down, 
and your type 1 error rates go up. That means you're more likely to get a false positive, and that is not what we want. So in our skipping class example, if we use standard regression, we'd be violating the independence assumption because the observations within each class are correlated. Specifically, the way that I simulated these data, there is no correlation between skipping class and grade in class one. There's a negative correlation in class two and a large negative correlation in class three. So the observations aren't independent, right? I just told you that they're correlated. The ones coming from the same class are more similar to one another than the ones coming from different classes. That means we can't just run a standard regression on these data, show that skipping class hurts your grades, publish it in science and call it a day. This time we can't do that. So what do we do? Well, one option has to do with design choices. You could, in theory, design all of your studies so that you only have one student per class, or in a different study in which you typically have each person provide multiple responses, you could just get one observation per participant. But that reduces statistical power. If you have the option of collecting data from multiple students in a class, then you should. Also, this option just isn't feasible in some experimental context. It just doesn't make any sense. If you're conducting a study where response time is the outcome, it would be so silly to have a participant come in, press a button once, get paid two cents for their time, and be on their way. So you should always carefully consider design choices before conducting any experiment and before doing any stats. But in most cases, those dependencies are there for a reason. Right, the type of research you do means that you collect multiple observations from some grouping factor, like classes or participants. So any design choices you make to try to make those observations independent would be ill-advised. So how do you analyze your data when you know those dependencies are there? Well, in the past, people have relied on aggregation. So instead of entering individual data points into your analysis, you enter means. So in the class example, instead of entering a bunch of data points from the same class into the regression, which would violate the independence assumption, you just enter three means, one per class. Now look, aggregation is great. It suppresses error, and there's a time and a place for that. But I just gave away the key point. It suppresses error, meaning that the model will underestimate variability, right? If the data we have are like this, but the only thing we tell the model about are the means, we've lost a ton of information about variability within those classes. Now, of course, this is an extreme example because we've reduced the data to just three points. But the point is that when you aggregate, you lose information. All right, I want to show you an extreme version of what can happen when you violate the independence assumption. And here, aggregation doesn't help. This is known as Simpson's paradox. All right, let's suppose you're interested in how the price of a house is related to the number of bedrooms in that house. You'd probably expect that houses with more bedrooms are more expensive, right? More bedrooms means a larger footprint, which means more money. But here are the data you get. Homes with more bedrooms appear to be less expensive. Now, you might look at this and think, well, gosh, this doesn't make any sense. We must have coded something incorrectly or accidentally plotted the inverse of home price or something like that. So just to be sure your eyes aren't deceiving you, you run a regression on these data. And indeed, number of bedrooms has a negative association with home price. But as you're pondering these puzzling results, you realize that when you collected the data, you collected them from four discrete types of homes. You collected data from homes located downtown, those located just on the edge of downtown, those located in the suburbs, and those located in rural areas. So out of curiosity, you decide to remake this plot, but instead of plotting everything in gray, you plot each type of home in a different color, just to see if anything stands out. And here's what you find. Well, that's certainly odd. These data form beautiful clusters as if someone simulated them to do so. But when you look more closely, you see that within each cluster, the number of bedrooms appears to be positively related to home price, which is just what you expected. And being the thorough researcher you are, you run separate regressions on each of the home types. And it confirms your intuition. There's a positive relationship between the number of bedrooms and the price of the home within each home type. But there's still that negative relationship overall. So what on earth is going on here? When we look at the data together and ignore home type, thereby violating the independence assumption, we see a negative relationship. And guess what? In these cases, aggregation doesn't help. So if instead of plotting all of those points, we only plot four means, one per home type, we still see that puzzling negative association. So the reason this is happening is that the four types of homes differ both in the number of bedrooms and in their price. Overall, homes located downtown have a small number of bedrooms, but they're expensive, right? Because they're located in the city whereas homes located in the suburbs and in rural areas have many more bedrooms, and they tend to be less expensive overall because they're further away from the city. But within each home type, 
homes with more bedrooms tend to be more expensive. So yes, overall, homes located downtown have only a few bedrooms and are very expensive, but the homes located downtown with lots of bedrooms are even more expensive. And even though rural homes tend to have more bedrooms than those located downtown, and they tend to be cheaper, those massive rural homes with a billion bedrooms are super expensive. So we see different effects when we look between versus within home type. And this is where the beauty of multi-level modeling comes in. We can give multi-level models all of the data without aggregating by home type, but we can tell it about home type. So basically we're giving it these data. And when we build this multi-level model, everything is totally fine. The relationship between the number of bedrooms and home price is positive, just as we expected. This is known as Simpson's paradox. The relationship between a predictor and an outcome might be different on the aggregate than it is when you look at some higher level grouping cluster, in this case, home location. And this is why mixed effects modeling is so important. When you ignore these dependencies in your data by running a standard regression or by aggregating across levels within a group, you can sometimes draw erroneous conclusions. Now, repeated measures ANOVAs can take some of these dependencies into account, but they don't tell you about the magnitude or the direction of the effect. And there are ways to extract that information, but you could still be led astray if you weren't careful. And that's one benefit of regression over ANOVAs generally. Regression gives you information not just about the overall model fit, but also about the magnitude and the direction of the relationships among the variables. And ANOVAs don't do that by default. Another benefit of mixed effects models over ANOVAs is that if you have multiple grouping factors in your experiment, so like if you have participants that are giving multiple responses and items that are responded to multiple times, repeated measures ANOVAs aggregate across one of those. So they can't simultaneously model participant and item level effects. And in these cases, what people have done in the past is perform by item and by participant analyses, which means that the data entered into the analysis have either been collapsed across participants or items. But the thing is, by participant and by item analyses can produce different results. And people have come up with ways to combine the results of those analyses, or sometimes they just report the analysis with the highest p-value, but there are issues with that too. All right, yet another issue with ANOVAs is that they can only deal with data where the outcome is continuous and the predictors are categorical. This means that if you have an experiment in which the outcome is categorical, like accuracy at identifying particular items in, say, a recognition memory task or a speech identification task, those observations have to be aggregated so you end up with proportions rather than zeros and ones, or you have to analyze it with a different technique altogether. This restriction also means that continuous predictors, so like time in a longitudinal study, those have to be treated categorically, and that reduces statistical power and makes it really difficult to model nonlinear relationships between your predictors and your outcome. As a side note, if you discretize something like time, ANOVA assumes that the spacing of those categories is the same for all individuals, and that's rarely the case in practice in a longitudinal study. All right, last but not least, mixed effects models are inherently more flexible than ANOVAs, and they can extend seamlessly to generalized linear models, which can incorporate, for example, categorical outcomes. Now, I'm going to be staying on the frequentist side of things, but I do want to note that being more familiar with the R package for building these models, which is called LME4, that makes the transition to Bayesian multi-level modeling way less scary than it otherwise would be. There's this awesome R package for Bayesian multi-level modeling. It's called BRMS, and it uses the same syntax as LME4, which is the frequentist one, but it uses Bayesian stats behind the scenes. So I have found that learning about mixed effects modeling from a frequentist perspective actually makes the transition to Bayesian stats easier. So just another plus of learning about mixed effects models now. All right, team, we've made it. Here we are at mixed effects models. Let's go. Put simply, all the shortcomings of ANOVAs and multiple regression I just described could be avoided by using linear mixed effects models. These models are just an extension of multiple regression, but they can take all kinds of dependencies into account. I've already mentioned a few examples of dependencies, but to make things more concrete, here are some examples. Students are nested within classes, like in the skipping class example I already talked about, but classes are also nested within schools. That kind of nesting structure involves three-level models. We're not gonna get into detail about those, but it's really important to point out that classes within schools are not independent, just like students within classes aren't independent either. Observations within people are not independent. So if you're conducting a response time study, one person may respond more quickly than another. So those observations within a participant are correlated. And similarly, observations within items are correlated. Here's one last example. 
Observations from different people within the same county are likely to be related, and counties within the same state are likely to be related as well. So that's another type of dependency that you might see in your data. And there are tons and tons and tons of examples of these. And if you fail to take those dependencies into account, that can lead to more unexplained variability, it can increase your type 1 error rates, and in cases like Simpson's paradox, it can lead to completely opposite conclusions. And this is why mixed effects models are great. They can simultaneously take multiple dependencies into account. And they do that by modeling what are called fixed and random effects. All right, so these mixed effects models are called mixed because they simultaneously are modeling both of these different types of effects, fixed and random. Let's start with the simpler ones, the fixed effects. These are basically the condition effects you've dealt with in the multiple regression or ANOVA framework. They're these population level average trends that persist across experiments. So if you conducted the same experiment again with different participants or items, provided that those new participants and items come from the same population as in the original study, you expect that your fixed effects will show the same pattern of results. So if you're conducting a study where you're looking at whether a treatment improves outcomes, that treatment effect, that's a fixed effect. Whereas fixed effects model average trends, random effects model the extent to which those trends vary across levels of some grouping factor, like variation across classes or across participants. Random effects are clusters of dependent data points in which the component observations, so the observations forming the cluster, like students within a class or trials within a participant, they come from the same higher level group, in this case class or participant. Now, Understanding random effects can be tricky, um, and I blame the use of the word random. There is a reason they're called random effects, but if you find that terminology confusing, feel free to replace the word random in your head with cluster level or group level or group varying, something like that. Anything about variation across groups or clusters. Random effects are included in mixed effects models to account for the fact that particular groups might behave differently from the average trend. I realize that throwing out definitions of fixed and random effects is confusing, so now I'm going to walk through some visualizations showing how random effects build on the standard regression we know and love. The plots I'm going to show you come from fake data from four hypothetical participants. Each one is shown here in a different shape, and each participant responded to four items. Now, of course, you should have more than four participants and items, but this keeps things simple. We're interested in how word difficulty affects response times. Here, word difficulty goes from 0 to 10, where 0 represents very easy and 10 represents very difficult. First, we're going to consider a model with no random effects. This is just a standard regression model. Here, the only fixed effects are word difficulty and the intercept. This regression line is showing us that the more difficult words tend to elicit slower response times. But because there are no random effects, the model estimates are exactly the same for every participant. This model is predicting just one regression line, that applies to all observations. And so what happens is the residual error, which is shown in the vertical lines here, is pretty large. This model also violates the independence assumption because points coming from the same participant are correlated, but this model is ignoring those dependencies. Got it? Okay, now we're gonna add some random effects. What we're gonna do is tell the model that the data actually come from four different participants to resolve that non-independence problem. The first step is to account for the fact that some participants respond more quickly than others. These random deviations across participants from the mean response time are called random intercepts. Again, if you find the word random confusing, go ahead and replace it with participant varying intercepts. That means the same thing. Here, each dashed gray line represents model predictions for a single participant, and that solid black line is still the estimate for the average fixed trend. This model accounts for the fact that some participants respond more quickly than others, right? And so it's doing a better job predicting response times for any given participant because it's allowing each participant to have their own intercept. So what we get is a vertical shift in the participant's regression line from the average trend. If they respond more slowly, their regression line is shifted up. And if they respond more quickly, their regression line is shifted down. I also want to point out that the residual error, those vertical lines, is much smaller in this random intercepts model relative to the fixed effects only model on the previous slide. This is because here the residual error represents deviation from a particular participant's regression line rather than that overall regression line, which might not fit an individual participant's data particularly well. Okay, so each line is shifted up or down, but the lines are still parallel, meaning we're assuming that each person is affected by word difficulty to the same extent. In other words, we're saying that a one unit change in word difficulty is associated with the same magnitude of change in response time for every single participant. But that's not really a reasonable assumption to make, right? People are different. And guess what? 
We can account for that in our model by including random slopes. Again, if you find the term random confusing, it can help to think of these as participant varying slopes. Same thing. So now not only are we accounting for the fact that some participants respond more quickly than others, but we're also accounting for the fact that some people are less affected by word difficulty than others are. And again, now you can see that residual error is even smaller because now the regression lines are really tailored to the individual. Pretty cool, right? Okay, that is a lot of information to take in, so we're gonna stop there for today. But to summarize what we've talked about so far, the independence assumption is a really important one in regression. And anytime you have multiple observations within some group or cluster, you're violating it if you ignore those dependencies. Now you could aggregate across levels of some grouping factor, and this is typically what you need to do to run an ANOVA, but then you're giving your model way less information to work with, and so it's gonna underestimate variability, which increases your type one error rate. Repeated measures ANOVAs can cleanly handle data from some experimental designs, but there are limitations, and mixed effects models can address those shortcomings through the use of fixed effects, which represent population level average trends, and random effects, which represent cluster level trends. All right, that's all I have for you today. I'll see you next time when we actually get into some of the math and my good friends Beta, U, Gamma, and Epsilon will be heavily featured. Bye.